So in terms of Justin's bio, uh, Justin completed a BSc in Mechanical Engineering and a BSc in Russian Studies at the University of Calgary. He then completed a Master's in Aeronautical Engineering at MIT with his research and thesis focused on energy economics. After completing his degree at MIT, Justin joined McKenzie & Company where he worked on energy company strategy and valuations. He then went to work for the Investment Banking Energy Group at BMO Capital Markets. Uh, after founding the research company X-Edge, uh, a company specializing in rigorous stochastic analysis of oil and gas exploration portfolios, that's a mouthful, uh, Justin joined uh, Salman Partners where he has been uh, since uh, December uh, 2011. Since joining Salman Partners, Justin earned his CFA designation and has initiated coverage on 11 Canadian listed EMP companies operating in Latin America. Uh, currently, Justin is also working on initiating coverage on 10 EMP companies operating in Africa. With that, I'll pass the floor off to Justin. Thank you. So it wasn't too long ago that I had the opportunity to come and speak uh, to the SPE membership, and so I appreciate the opportunity to come back um, and, and do it again. I've been I've been asked this time by by Andrew to try to um, try to focus a little more on fundamental value issues and, and ways guys look at value in the oil and gas business before jumping too quickly into Monte Carlo uh, simulations and what, mm -hmm. what we're sort of proposing is different. So I will try to do that and if, if I'm moving too fast I hope you'll uh, you know just shout out and tell me to slow down or ask questions so feel free. Um, I also wanted to get a bit of better idea of the audience before us today. Um, if, if, you, if you think about your job in terms of you know, some weighted towards technical engineering, geology type work, or more weighted towards sort of financial analysis, valuation type work. And I know there's overlap there, so try to try to kind of decide what side of the fence you're kind of more more of your work is on. Let's just do a quick survey on, on those two. So, who here would be kind of more technically focused in terms of their workflow? Okay, great. And then in terms of financial analysis, valuation, who would be more focused? All those Solomon Partners guys at the back. Oh Great. Well, I'm really happy to hear that. So, so we're definitely more technically focused in this room, and so we'll be able to focus more on kind of the, the core evaluation um, items. So before jumping in, I, I, I wanted to take a big step back and kind of pose a question for, for the room here about the nature of value in terms of coming up with valuations for anything, be it an oil and gas company or, or anything else. Um, and just something for you to ponder is, you know, how, how, do, how do you answer the question, what is value? Or where does value come from? And it turns out that economists and, and uh, political scientists have been studying this question for some time. You know, Karl Marx came up with this theory of value that was that, uh, you know, labor and the amount of labor that goes into a good is really what drives how much that good should be worth. So it's sort of a labor theory of value. Uh, David Ricardo came out and started to come up with some ideas uh, of his own that were relating more to the consumer demand side of the equation. Um, those ideas were improved upon by Alfred Marshall and eventually evolved into the modern theory of, of economic value. And it's really the idea that um, consumers uh, determine what value is. So value for every consumer of a good it differs by consumer. Some might put a higher value on, you know, the Lord of the Rings movie. Another person might put a lower value on that, and that's what defines their personal preference. Is what defines the value of a good, not how many actors were paid in the production of, of the movie, as say Karl Marx might suggest. Um, and so I'm going to go with that assumption and assume that that you're on board with me and modern economists on that kind of theory of value. Um, now. You and I intuitively kind of make decisions about value all the time. You know, you go to the, the supermarket and you, you look at, you know, the, the apples that you're thinking of buying and one of the first things you do if you're an astute shopper is you compare kind of the dollars per gram that you're paying for apples here versus the apples over there. You might account for some quality differences, but you're instantly doing what we would call a multiples analysis where you're comparing like with like and trying to say where is the most bang for my buck. Um, so this is something that, you know, determining value, we do all the time ourselves. 
in, uh, in coming to the next page, in oil and gas, we do the same thing. Okay? We, it, of course, we're not dealing in apples, we're dealing with oil and gas companies, but we're trying to compare these companies against each other and come up with, based on the, the, the comparisons, who we think is overvalued and undervalued, and this would be considered a multiples analysis. So on the, on the top side, it's kind of difficult to see, so I'll just uh, describe it. Basically what you have is you first have to come up with the price of a mm -hmm. company so that we talk in terms of enterprise value for oil and gas companies, and that's mm -hmm. essentially the, the value of the shareholders. So if you add up all the shares and you times that by the price, that value plus the value of the debt holders. So you add those two groups together, those are the people who have claim on the company, and that gives you the enterprise value or the total value of the company, the price. And then on the denominator, if you want to get a multiple, you might divide that enterprise value by, say, reserves. So you might look at the, the probable 2P reserves, proven plus probable, and to take that EV number and divide it by 2P to come up with a dollar per barrel of what you know, X company is worth. And then you can take that number and you can start to compare it to other companies and say, oh, well, this one looks undervalued or this one looks overvalued. So this is a very quick and dirty way to kind of quickly get an idea of uh, you know, the value of different companies. Um, and you can do it on, on trading. What we mean by trading is you look at the current market price and you use that as a starting point to get the enterprise value. You can also use it on transactions. When, when CNOC uh, bought, bought Nexon, you could look at the price that they offered, come back out the enterprise value of, of Nexon, and then divide it by how many barrels Nexon has and come up with a valuation per barrel. You can also do it on a valuation per, or an EV per flowing barrel. So there's different ways that you can use this, but it's very much just like the, you know, in the, sh in the, uh, in the safe way, comparing apples with apples. You're just, you're just dividing the, the price of something by some measure of value, be it reserves or, or production. Now, there, there are certainly drawbacks to this, to this method of, of value. I guess I'll, I'll start by posing a question, maybe make this a little more interactive, despite the podium here. Um, you know, what, what are some drawbacks to this approach to value? Are there any ideas out there? Time value of money is not gain. Time value of money, yeah, absolutely. Well, you're assuming that the market is a form. Yes, yeah. It may be a lot of imperfect information. And in regard with Nexon, <coughs> you know, you got to compare apples to apples. Mm -hmm. Nexon had a lot of debt, there's risk associated with that. So you got to make sure you compare similar risk factors. There may be another company that's got a lot of similarities but less debt. So yeah. to I think you nailed the two. I mean, basically, the ones I had listed here was, uh, you, you know, apples to apples comparison. If you're if you're looking at two very different companies, you know, you can't be using a multiple to, to, to get that value. I think that's pretty intuitive. It doesn't need much more explanation. And then I think the other point you made right off the get go was that it doesn't give you a sense of absolute value. It, it gives you a sense of what it is worth relative to this price, but who's saying that that other company isn't overvalued or undervalued in the marketplace, right? And, and that comes to the time value question as well. Um, so, you, so you, you know, you might get an idea of relative to what the market is valuing, but maybe the market's over exuberant and tomorrow there's going to be a massive sell off in the market. So it, gives, it, it fails on two accounts. It doesn't give you an absolute kind of theoretically satisfying framework for value um, uh, on the one side and on the other side you're comparing oftentimes oil companies are all not all created equal so you're not creating like with like or comparing like with like. Mm -hmm. So there are, of course are ways to address those concerns um, and the most kind of satisfying way to address it is just going back to that initial question is what is value? <laughs> And in an oil and gas world, if you simplify it down to the, the bare bones, it's very simply, you know, the ability to generate cash, right? How much money you can generate versus how much money you have to pay to, to generate that cash. Um, you know, the equation I want, I want you to get kind of fixed in your head is, is P times Q minus cost. Very simple. So the price times the quantity, how many barrels you're selling, minus the cost to produce those barrels. Um, everything else, all the accounting complexity, fiscal terms, everything is just a subset of that general equation. Okay, so it's so the three variables are price, quantity, and cost. Um, now, if, if we take a very simple example, in this in this uh, slide we've got a, a a very simple kind of asset with a production rate and an economic life, a decline rate, and that sort of thing. But before we get into those details. Just think very simply, you know, what, what does the value say of, you know, take this number, I think I have 35,000 up there, 35,000 barrels, um, let's say we can get $90 a barrel for it, and it's got operating costs effectively of uh, $30 and taxes of 10. 
So if you do the math, you're getting a profit of $50 per barrel. You multiply it by the number of barrels. Very simple. You get a number, which is, I think the number is $1.75 million, is what that is worth at an instant of time. So that's very simple. Now let's add a complicating factor. This gentleman mentioned time value. Okay, so let's say instead of that 35,000 barrels being sold today, we're going to sell it with no uncertainty a year from now. So is that also worth $1.75 million? And this comes back to time value. Um, I, I guess a question for the audience is, who, who isn't familiar with the time value of money idea? I guess pretty much everybody is, so we can <laughs> move along pretty quickly. I mean, it, it, it's interesting because, you know, to this audience, everybody understands the time value of money uh, issue. But, you know, for many, many centuries, this was not an intuitive concept. It, you, you've heard of usury laws and, and how usury is a sin, and in a lot of cultures and, and religions, it still is. And it was in Christianity for quite some time as well. Um, you know, so the idea of usury of charging interest for money to compensate for that time value component is certainly not something that is, that is intuitive to people. It's something that has to kind of be taught um, through courses and, and through kind of reasonable analysis. Um, so we've talked about value, we've talked about the time value component of, of, um, of value. The next component I want to talk about is uncertainty. So let's, you know, the, the interesting thing about uncertainty, thinking about that equation again, P times Q minus cost, is each of those variables, the price of oil for example, the, the quantity of oil that a company is going to cost, are all very uncertain. We know that. So we can't just use these simple equations to come up with the value. And it's actually one of the most you know, interesting parts of, of the oil and gas business is if you look at the price, you know, what's driving the uncertainty in price? You have political effects, you have economic effects. Are people always going to demand oil? Are there going to be substitution effects? So it's a very complicated, kind of exciting, engaging um, space to analyze. If you look at the quantity, the Q in that equation, you know, what are the uncertainties driving that? A lot of that is technically driven. You know, what, what, what are the nature of the rocks? You know, how, how are they going to produce? How are they going to respond to different kinds of stimulus? Um, and then cost equally is, is a, a function of technical issues, economic issues, political issues. So this whole space is, you know, the upstream oil and gas space is a fascinating space to be in because it's got all these difficult uncertainties that we've got to kind of comb through and try to get to the bottom of. Now, in, in terms of how do people deal with this uncertainty and, and you know, think about this uncertainty, well, there's, there's different tools that, that we use. And the first kind of tool is... Um, the risk premium. So we've, we've already talked about time value of money and how you can, you can charge a, 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 you assume that the same cash flow a year from now is worth less than, than that cash flow today. In addition, if there's uncertainty associated with that cash flow, you can use a higher premium or a risk premium to discredit the future cash flow or discount it even further. Um, and so that's what we call a risk premium. That, that's one method to deal with these kinds of uncertainties. It's not always the most satisfying. Sometimes it's kind of arbitrary and people really debate and discuss these discount rates. Um, you know, the difficult to solution. An another solution is um, probabilistic modeling. And it's not a mutually exclusive solution. You can do both. <laughs> you can use risk premiums and also probabilistic uh, modeling. But I want to start by kind of jumping more into the transition between what we've been talking about, multiples, discount rates, and, or discounted cash flows, and move this into the world of Monte Carlo simulations. And how is a Monte Carlo simulation, which is one kind of probabilistic model, different than a discounted uh, cash flow model, for instance? So on this page, on the top side, you're seeing a sort of that same kind of model that we saw before that was very simple. It's the same kind of idea, a few more variables. You've got inputs on the left-hand side. They get processed in a model engine, and then out pops your, your um, kind of outputs in terms of how many reserves you have. And, cash flows and that sort of thing. So that's, that would be your normal sort of DCF model, and you would discount those cash flows and come up with a valuation. All that a probabilistic model is, or in this case a, a Monte Carlo is, is you're taking some of those inputs that you see on the top, and you're defining them not by single numbers, but you're defining them by a distribution. So what that means is there is no deterministic solution to the model. You can't just run the model once and say this is what the output is. You have to, you have to run it many thousands of times, and you, the output is also a set of curves, um, like you see over here, that you know, for every time it runs the model, it's picking a different number out of that input distribution curve and generating a different output. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, what a Monte Carlo simulation is. I'm going to skip through that way too much text. Can't read it. So this is the, the page I want you to, uh, you know, if you remember one page today, I hope it's this page. Um, 
because we've talked a lot about kind of the uncertainties and some of the different tools that are out there and available for people to use to try to do modeling. And the key question before us is, okay, what tool do we use? We're trying to model, we're trying to value a company. What should we be using to do that? So I'm going to set this, this table up for you and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. So on the, on the x-axis, you have increasing outcome certainty. So as you're moving to the right of the page, the outcome of the asset in terms of the cash flows and the production and all that, those sorts of things is becoming increasing certain, increasingly certain. And then on the y-axis, you have an understanding of the possible outcomes. So this would be things like being able to characterize probabilistically what are the likely outcomes. Now let me try to, especially the y-axis is a little bit difficult to understand, so I'll, I'll use an example. So, so right now I have a, uh, a number in my pocket, uh, it's written on, a, on the back of a business card, and I want you to think what number that could potentially be. All right? Just and you don't have to answer, just think about it. Of course the answer is you have no clue, it could be anything. There's a wide range of, of, of possibilities there. Now, now let's play the same game, but this time you know, I'm going to hold an, an, one of my fingers up behind my back, and I want you again to think about how many fingers I could be holding. Now both of these games are fundamentally uncertain. You're not sure what the outcome is, how many fingers I have or what numbers in my pocket, but they're very different kinds of uncertainty and I think you can kind of intuitively feel that. And what is the difference in the uncertainty? It's the y-axis. It's the ability for you to characterize the range of outcomes and the chances of those various outcomes. So coming back to the oil and gas world, when you go out to sort of a frontier land where there's no aero mag and there's no seismic and there hasn't been any work done on it, there's no analogs, no well control, you're kind of in this bottom left corner where you know you might have some land but you have no idea what it's worth in terms of you're not sure you haven't uh, produced any leads yet, you, you can't value that land. And if anybody tries to give you a dollar per acre or anything like that, it's not going to give you a, a, a satisfying sense of what it's truly worth. Um, if you try to run a Monte Carlo on some random distributions that people give you, it's not good. It's just garbage in, garbage out. It's not going to give you, you know, a reasonable number. Um, so we're in the bottom left. As you run your seismic, as you start to uh, characterize the prospects, develop leads, and, and evolve them into prospects and drill ready prospects, you're gradually moving up the left hand side of, of the graph here, and eventually la landing into this sort of space of, you know, the the, the, the hand behind the back, where you don't know what's going to happen when you drill a well but you can have a pretty good idea of some of the probabilities and the range of distributions that, you, that, that are before you. And so you have to make a choice based on that uncertainty, but at least you can characterize it. Um, and then once you drill the well, you, you de-risk it. You either find oil or you don't, and you start to, over time, as you get declines, you can start to de-risk uh, what the ultimate reserves are going to be, and you're, you're gradually moving towards the right-hand side of the page. Okay, so that's kind of the framework that I want you to think about. And, and my argument today before you is that in the top left corner, when you're in this world of well-defined prospects, um, you know where data isn't garbage, this is where the Monte Carlo simulation really comes uh, comes into play and can give us a lot better insight into the value, the true value uh, of a company. And my criticism today of, of current practice is that we are applying tools that are in the top right, tools for producing assets, DCF modeling multiples. We're applying those tools to assets that are fundamentally in the top left. Okay, so we use things called risked nav. You may have heard of that used on the streets, very common. Um, those are applying DCF type tools to, to assets that are, you know, should be probabilistically modeled. And this is, you know, just kind of reiterating what I just said. So we'll, we can skip to that. But on the top page or the top hand side of the page, is talking about producing assets, giving it a check mark because you know we're using DCF and multiples to model things that are in the top right. So there's no problem. But then on expiration assets, here's an example of how they're being modeled on the street today. Um, and this is sort of best, of best practice as well. As, you know, some guys just do multiples, but you're looking at working interest, you're multiplying that by the middle of the distribution for a given prospect, multiplying that by the chance of geological success, you're getting a risk reserve number, you're plugging that number into a black box, kind of uh, your DCF model, and out pops the, the valuation per share. You add those all up, and that's the, the value of the, of the, um, of the expiration portfolio. And my argument, again, is that you're using top right tools for something that is fundamentally in the top left. So page 11 here is trying to get at, you know, okay, so let's say you're with me and that you think that we should be using Monte Carlo for, for expiration assets, the ones that are well defined. The question then is, okay, well, what is it actually worth? And how, how can we, you know, once we've generated this, this curve of outcomes based on the expiration portfolio, how do we actually go from this 
complicated curve to a single number to say that's what you should be willing to pay for the expiration portfolio. It's a difficult uh, issue. The, the, the two key drivers to that, if you think about it intuitively, is A, the amount of downside risk. So once you've generated your curve, you're going to have an average outcome. And then you've got to think, okay, well, as an investor, I'm, I'm risk averse. So I need to be compensated for the downside in the curve. So what we've done is we, we look at that downside in the curve. We figure out the semi-deviation of the curve. So how much uh, semi-deviation is, is a proxy for risk. And then based on that semi-deviation and on the price of risk, we come up with a discount to the mean of the curve to say, okay, well, based on the, this kind of tail, you should adjust it down this much. So the idea is that as your tail grows um, or gets fatter, the amount of compensation increases, so the value of the portfolio comes down. Um, and similarly, the other key driver is the price of risk. So this is really just the slope of the risk return graph. In the investment world, the, the, the Coles note version is that as you're increasing risk for a given investment, you demand a higher return. Right, to compensate you for the additional risk that you're taking on. And the slope of that, of that risk return kind of relationship, we call that the sharp ratio, it's essentially the slope. And so if you can imagine if, the, if it's very uh, shallow slope, that means that you can take on a lot of risk and not demand very much incremental uh, return, and vice versa. If it's a very steep uh, slope, then you demand a lot of return for a small amount of extra risk. Right, but that that and it turns out guys have looked at the S and P 500. They've looked at different indexes, and they've you know looked at uh, market participants' risk aversion. It turns out it's about 0.35 to 0.4 is actually the the kind of the market average investors' risk aversion and sharp ratio. So that's the number that we use. That's just a fixed number. Uh, but so we take that price of risk. We we figure out the amount of risk for a given portfolio. We adjust down the the mean value and come up with uh, our valuation. Um, and then one more page here that I want to really spend some time on. How are we doing for time there, Andrew? Got lots. Got lots? Okay. You guys are doomed. <laughs> okay, so example of risk nav versus Monte Carlo. So I wanted to take one more shot. I'm trying to, you know, make the case here for Monte Carlo in the right conditions. And this is my last page to do that. So on this page, we have kind of a simplified game that's trying to simulate a oil and gas expiration well. So the game is simple. You flip a coin. If you get heads, you get to reach inside this box and you get to pull out a number. Um, if you get tails, you get nothing. And you get to keep whatever number you pull out of the box. You only get to play the game once, so you can't use statistics to get out of this. You have to now make a decision of what is this worth to an investor? What would you pay to play this game? And this is, you know, analogous to the, the situation when you're drilling an expiration well, where a lot of the times you're going to have a dry well or a non-commercial well, and you have to account for that. Uh, but you still go and drill a well because there's, there's value there. But what is the value? What is the, the value of that well? Now, if you use the standard technique uh, that that, are, that analysts have been using, is you would you would do a risk nav, which is you would take the distribution. The average of that distribution is 500. That's the un uh, or sorry, I think yeah, it's a thousand is the average, it's the, the mean, and then the standard deviation, deviation doesn't come into the calculation. 500, I don't care if it's 500, I don't care if it's 1,000, I don't care if it's zero. It's not part of the method one analysis. So they, they, look over, they look over the standard deviation, they take that mean value, they risk it by 50%, because that's the chance of success, and they come up with $500. That's the value of the game. Now, is that really the value of the game? Intuitively, it doesn't feel like it. If I was offering you a $500 bill no matter what, yeah, that's worth $500. But as soon as I start to add risk to it, that you might, you know, with the same payoff, same expected value, but increasing amounts of risk that you don't get that $500, you're going to want to pay less and less for it to compensate you for that risk. So if, it, it turns out if you run the Monte Carlo and use the process that I've talked about uh, to, to adjust for the downside in the tail of outcomes, you come up with a value of 324 in this case. So uh, I was asked a question today um, at, uh, about... Or do you generally come up with higher or lower valuations? Well, the answer is you actually generally come up with lower valuations um, because you're accounting for the, the downside tail risk in the expiration portfolio. So if you look at where my target prices are relative to most of the street, for most companies, I'm right at the bottom. And there's a few where I'm not, and you should go buy those companies. Um, <laughs> Okay, so let's just bring it all together. So how do I actually go about, or how do we go about uh, coming up with a valuation for an oil and gas company? So kind of taking all these tools that, uh, that you've heard about. So the first step 
is to assemble the prospect portfolio and try to disentangle um, kind of lead, early stage leads, midstream leads, you know, prospects, drill ready prospects, all from each other and, and decide what we're going to actually put into the Monte Carlo. So we'll set up something like this, we'll go through, we'll identify the whole portfolio and where we actually focus our attention is on kind of that orange numbers or the orange bo uh, boxes uh, and the green boxes which are the prospects that are drill ready and, uh, and the prospects that are in delivery mode that are, you know, some of the uncertainty, we're, we're satisfied with the degree of uncertainty in the distributions. Um, so we'll focus on those and that means that we're missing some potential value absolutely in the prospect identification stage. There may be some leads that have a lot of value, but at the end of the day, we can't value that. You can't put a number on some of those assets and we'll talk about it qualitatively, we'll discuss those, the potentiality there, but we'll focus our quantitative analysis on, the on, on these uh, second two. And then, so we'll apply the Monte Carlo approach to that, but then for the for the assets that have discovered oil and have come up with a, a satisfying development plan and booked reserves, we'll apply a deterministic DCF. So we won't add that extra complexity of Monte Carlo because we feel it's in that top right of that graph, if you remember, and we feel that it's, there's enough de-risking that has gone on that, that a normal DCF model uh, is fine. Um, in terms of how our reports look, we they look like this kind of in the top left. This shows you how we build up to our value. So number one is Jumping back, I'm going to be going back and forth here. Number one is this deterministic DCF analysis where we're looking just at the reserves, the cash, kind of the core assets. Uh, we model the GNA of the company and come up with, with a dollar per share value. In this case, this is a Pacific Rubialis example from you know, maybe eight months ago. Um, and if you, if you draw your eyes from num bucket number one down to the bottom left, you can see the waterfall chart that kind of breaks it down asset by asset. So we have the Rubialis field, the Kifa North Bay, the Kifa Southwest, Sabanera, all the different f fields that these guys have. We model all those cash flow, uh, all those assets independent of one another, um, and then uh, add them all up, adjust for a few tax effects and cash and GNA, and then come up with a single number that says, you know, per share, this is what the core asset portfolio is worth. Then we go to number two bucket, which is the Monte Carlo. So if you slide your eyes over to the top right, number two takes the, the, the portfolio. In this case, we modeled something like, I, I call it 70 prospects, uh, 70 drill ready prospects that my, that, uh, that uh, Pacific Group of Alice had, kind of ready to drill. And again, we focus on prospects that kind of are in the next year or two, um, that are very high probability that they're going to get drilled and the company has either announced their plans to drill it or it's very clear that they will drill it based on the kind of the value of the prospect and it's been the, the uncertainty associated with the data is, is reasonable. So those prospects we ran through Monte Carlo. We, this was the output curve that we got on the y-axis is the frequency. So that's how many times, every time you run the Monte Carlo it kind of builds up and so the most frequent result was I, I can't even make it out there, I'm sure you can't. Two, 2.30 it looks like, kind of at the, at the peak there between the blue and the red. Shows you the most common outcome for that expiration portfolio was $2.30 per share was the value. Um, but of course there's this big tail that if everything goes well and the stars align, the, the, the stock could go like crazy and, and also you have the downside risk. So what we then do is take that curve, we determine the p-mean value, in this case 780 something, um, that's kind of the average. If you put all those numbers and then calculate the average, it's 781. And then you have to say, okay, well, there's this downside in that curve, and I have to compensate investors for that downside. And so that's where this, this adjustment comes into play. In this case, it's 241. That lands us to 542, and that number comes over on bucket two. So we give them credit for $5.42 per share for the value of the uh, expiration portfolio. And then there's a qualitative adjustment. This is where we account for things like political risk, um, capabilities of management that they may have that really positions them in a successful way. It's very hard to, to run any kind of uh, quantitative analysis on that. So what we do, is, and, but, and, but there's still a lot of value potentially. In the case of Rubialis, you know, these guys have a lot of uh, heavy oil expertise. They're an area of the world that's just kind of emerging as, as an important heavy oil player. Um, you know, Venezuela, if, if the leadership there ever was to change, and you know, at some point I'm sure it will, um, and it ever opened up, this company would be extremely well positioned to capitalize on, the, on those heavy oil um, assets. And so we feel that there is enough of a justification in terms of the management's capabilities to give them a little qualitative bump. Now, the thing is, you can, if you disagree with me, no problem, you can, you can knock off that 295 and you can have that debate. But this way it's very transparent. I'm not adding any multiples or any kind of thing that you can't see. It's all there. 
Um, and then the final point is dilution. This is simply the fact that we have a target price up here, the share price is here, and they have options. So if the, tar if the actual price actually reached our target price, you'd see the exercising of some of these options, and you'd have a little bit of share dilution, and that generally brings the price down slightly. Um, so that's, uh, in a nutshell, how we go about doing our valuation. So yeah, that's the end of our presentation. Uh, I guess we can have some time for some yeah. questions. Okay. Let's open it up for some questions. Yes, sir. I uh, just look back to your last graph, your probability. On the one, uh, the, the probability curve on the upper right side, how do you, how do you connect that and rationalize that with reserve estimate estimates, you know, the P90, P50, P10? Mm -hmm. I mean, those are probabilistic reserves too, and those have net, uh, uh, net NPVs established with them. And you kind of do the same thing as that, are you not? And uh, except you're involving expiration and a few things like that. but. How do you connect the two? Okay, so we, 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 draw, we draw a sharp distinction between reserves and resources. And of course there isn't such a thing. It's kind of an artificial thing that the industry has created as when can you book reserves versus when are they resources. There's actually kind of a transition process. But for the reserves, the 2P reserves, we, we just take the 2P number. We don't model proven with higher certainty and probable with lower certainty and then possible will generally take the 2P number unless we feel that there's a justification, like they drilled a new well since they had 2P that has uncovered some new resources. We'll try to adjust our 2P number accordingly. So we'll come up with our best assessment of the 2P reserves, and then we'll use that not for this curve. So that doesn't come into the curve at all. That comes into the bottom left of the page, which is the asset by asset breakdown. So we'll, we'll model, we'll give them full credit for their 2P reserves, period. No, no probability uh, uncertainty. The only way we deal with the inherent uncertainty, because there still is an uncertainty in 2P, of course, is with the discount rate. The, in this case, we use a 10% kind of across the board discount rate. So that would account for the fact that, you know, that is certainly not, um, you know, the 2P reserves is not 100%, there's, there's risk there. Um, and then in terms of the Monte Carlo, that only focuses on, um, on uh, the expiration portfolio, so the prospects, which would be not the P90, the P50, the P10s, and the and chance of success. Sometimes we'll also model um, possible reserves in there. Um, if we feel that, you know, if the production numbers are way up here and, you know, the wells are looking very good and the declines are steady and the reserves are way down there, we'll, we'll kind of call into question maybe the, the reserve engineer's judgment or, or, or analysis, maybe not judgment, maybe analysis, and we'll adjust, you know, we'll maybe give them some credit in the Monte Carlo for the possible and say, you know, so it is a case-by-case -case basis, but generally the, the way to think about it is 2P reserves go into company base and expiration assets go into the Monte Carlo. Yeah. Okay. How did you get that number from that curve? Yeah. So, okay. So, first of all, I'll, I'll assume you understand where the curve has come from. So, once you have this curve, you take the average of the curve. Okay. So, you add up all the numbers, divide them by the number of, of numbers that you have. In this case, we've made it in 10,000 iterations. So, you add up all the numbers, divide it by 10,000, and that's the average outcome. Okay. That's the p mean. Um, and in this case, that number is 783. It's the first number that you see kind of above the light green there. And then, let's go back a few pages. So we have that P mean value, but now we have this problem of, a, of additional risk. So do we want to pay the P mean value for this asset, or should we be compensated for the fact that we're taking on all this downside tail risk? And of course the answer is we, we need to be compensated. So this page, um, kind of lays out the detail of how we go about that. I don't actually have the, the uh, equation for that. I've actually, uh, for part of the process, I've actually filed a patent for it, so I'm kind of working on, you know, I, I can't provide all the detail, mm -hmm. but the, the main drivers of it are essentially the, the amount of downside risk, so how much um, semi-deviation, we use semi-deviation because it's not typically normal curves, it's typically log normal, um, for the amount of downside in the curve, so that we quantify that with semi-deviation. And then we, term, we determine, okay, that's how much risk there is. Okay, what's the price of risk? That's the sharp ratio I mentioned, the 0.35 and 0.4. So you use those in combination to come up with the risk deduction, how much you should actually compensate an investor for the tail. So as the tail swings out, that number gets bigger, and you have a bigger decline. Yeah? Um, my experience in doing A&D work for a number of years is I seldom see anyone that's prepared to pay for anything but proven plus probable reserves, mm -hmm. say. Up, the, the rest of the upside is why you're buying the company and you don't pay for that. How does, 
fact, rationalize with what you're doing here where you're adding a, a, a reasonable premium uh, for that upside potential. Sure. Um, well, let me, let, let me try to answer that in, in, in a couple ways. First of all, we know that investors give value for expiration. I mean, people talk about there's no expiration value. At the end of the day, look at Africa Oil. It's a one point, you know, X billion dollar company. It's pure expiration. So at the end of the day, you know, you don't need reserves to get value. We, we do see that in the market. But I agree with your point that generally it's extremely um, discounted or in many cases you know, people assign essentially no value to it. Um, so that, that is definitely the case. And, and my argument is that what, you know, one of the reasons that people don't assign value to it is they don't know what it's worth. And, and it's a kind of a tendency to kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater when you have no clue what something is worth and you're not satisfied, as they shouldn't be with the current analysis, it, you have a tendency to say, well, you know, whatever, or whatever rate you're using there, you know, I'm just, I'm going to take it as upside. So it's a way for us to kind of, because it's so complicated and people haven't kind of properly valued it, it's easy to throw that out and just to say, you know, that's the upside component. And my argument is, well, we know it has value. That's partly why you're buying the company. So it certainly has some value to it. What is the value? And so we're trying to go after that and uh, quantify it. The, um, the, the chart had a lot more I wish I had more curves here to show you because they're actually, it really depends on the portfolio. And like some curves, like Parix Resources, for example, they have almost a normal curve for the outcome, which is, it's very different than this one, which is, and I, th I think my, I think theirs is driven by, they have some very high potential, high risk um, assets in the heavy oil kind of region of Columbia. And if those kind of pan out, you get the tail, but there's a good chance they don't, and then, and then you get the bulge. So it's, it really is company by company, but yeah, I think you know, almost all wells in geology is characterized by log normal, right? The P90, they all, all the curves look like that. So if, if you don't have a lot of prospects in your portfolio, you're not well diversified, you'll almost always see something like that, or if it's a very risky portfolio. Whereas if it's less risky and there's more diversification, you'll see more of a normal distribution. Uh, <coughs> Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm glad you asked that because that's really the next project that I, I'd like to see this work be done on. The, the first stage of this, I mean, it's very preliminary. It's just, we've just rolled this out over the last kind of eight months. Um, and uh, we started with international, you know, in the introduction you heard South America, Africa. So we've, we've really focused on conventional sort of exploration type companies. We haven't looked at uh, tight sands, oil sands, you know, all the kind of exciting things going on here domestically. Um, so what I'm trying to do is, uh, you know, and if, if people here are interested in working with us on this, I'd like, th the next stage I'd like to do is to see what, you know, I think it's things like IP rates and different kind of well declines and things like that, but working with guys to figure out what are the key things that are characterizable where we have data, and I think we do have a lot of good data for a lot of the plays, and then to take th that data and, uh, and apply a, a very similar methodology to, for example, the IP rates uh, of wells and the correlations between wells for, for different places. But it's something that I'm definitely thinking about and I'm, I'd be really interested in doing if there's interest. Yeah. Do you input a distribution of price, oil price? Um, so this is, you're, you're going to get all the investment bankers riled up here because this, uh, this is fighting territory. But, um, I'll give you my view, and I, I promise you there are other views. So m my view is that oil price is a function of incredibly complicated factors. So um, economics, politics, uh, long-term demand, there's all sorts of factors going in. And I really hesitate to trust any individual's opinion on those factors. And so it turns out that, in my view, it's kind of in this bottom left corner of there's so much inherent uncertainty that trying to model it and trying to Monte Carlo it or anything like that is just going to be garbage in, garbage out. You might come up with a number. Now, maybe some people think they have a, a model that can do that, and, and you know, I, I'd like to see how much profit they're making, and that would be the best judge is if it's working. So what, what I do in the analysis is I'll just take the, you know, because I don't know and I, I don't feel confident in, in modeling that, 
I'll just take the futures curve, um, that, you know, the futures prices, and I'll use that as kind of the baseline. And you know, the futures price is always wrong too. <laughs> at the end of the day, so you know, to me, it's it's kind of like Winston Churchill's uh, adage about uh, you know, democracy being the best of the worst systems, right? It's, in my view, it's the futures curve is is it's certainly you know, who knows what's going to happen, but it's better than all uh, all the rest because at least people are betting on it. At least it's money, you know, on both sides being placed. Nobody has any other questions. I got a second one. Is uh, uh, okay in, in terms of internally, what I found a lot of the companies do in terms of evaluating exploration prospects or projects or whatever is, you know, a lot of people use the Monte Carlo method. But another one that I find is very commonly used is what I would class as a scenario method. Mm -hmm. You know, as an analyst, you end up looking at all kinds of scenarios. And management is asking, what about this, what about that, what happens to this, what happens to that. And eventually, they start getting a feeling for what's going on and make a judgment accordingly. And, you know, can one incorporate in terms of evaluating companies as an analyst, incorporating that, like, you know, you take Pacific Rubiales. Well, you know, what happens if those heavy oil fields in Colombia turn out? What's that mean? What happens mm -hmm. if? So have possible scenarios. Yeah. What happens if oil is 20 bucks a barrel? What happens if it's 150 mm -hmm. bucks a barrel? You know, what happens if interest rates go to 10 percent? What happens if it stays 1 percent? Yeah. Is there a value in, in that too? Because that's another way of looking yeah. at uncertainty. Yeah, I think I think um, Monte Carlo is is a subset of that. It's just it's a scenario. It's a kind of scenario analysis. It's possible scenario. It's just yeah. It's just streamlining yeah. it and and defining it as a distribution. You could also I think there's huge value at least as a first step to say okay here are the three um, scenarios. And one thing we do you mentioned you know what if oil is success, the heavy oil kind of turns out in in, in uh, Colombia. Um, one thing we do is in, in the Monte Carlo you can set up correlations between prospects right. So if this one's successful that changes your odds over here. And, you know things like that. So we, we try to do that again. You know it's always you're always dealing with limited data, and it, you know it's it's difficult because not all companies are as transparent as others. Um, so that's that's our con constant struggle with this whole methodology is trying to get the data quality to a point that you're happy with, and and we we've achieved that for the companies that we cover for the most part in our opinion. But it's you know it really limits me on some of the ability. Like like I had one company that I wanted to cover, um, and I just couldn't get enough satisfactory data on the exploration portfolio so I couldn't cover it. Um, you know, so it, it does limit your ability to cover, I think, some companies, but um, but yeah, so scenario analysis is definitely, you know, Monte Carlo is kind of a subset of that. It, it seems to me your methodology may also be dependent on the intended use. If your intended use is to buy a company, then once you've bought it, you've got it, there's no backing out. But if your intended use is, do I invest in this company's stock, uh, then there is an out, and there's less mm -hmm. less risk, depending on how you use your, your method. Mm -hmm. you, might, you, might, you might interpret the results differently. Yeah, no, I agree with that, absolutely. No, my I'm looking at this not from a planning perspective or a takeover perspective, I'm looking at it from a market value perspective. And you could apply these tools in different ways for different purposes. Like I, I've been talking to a lot of guys about planning, um, and I think there's a huge role for this kind of work in terms of helping stage wells, help helping to optimize decision making on, you know, field developments, and and uh, I think there's a lot of potential there as well. Oh, sorry. Yeah. When you're <coughs> building your distributions, do you do any truncation uh, of your prospect portfolio? Uh, certain uh, economic threshold for the weaker prospects? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one of the inputs to the um, prospect portfolio is commercial limit. So we have a separate model that basically runs every prospect on an unrisked basis and basically assumes success. And, it then, and then it runs a kind of a commerciality model, backs out what the limit is, the threshold, how much you have to find to make this thing commercial. And so we actually have built into the Monte Carlo every kind of step by step as it drills a well. Let's, let's say you have a, uh, a discovery. It doesn't assume instantly that it's commercial. So it'll it'll assume that you're going to drill an exploration well, uh, or sorry, an appraisal well. And then if uh, you, at that point it'll determine if it's a if it's above the commercial uh, threshold or not. So you may actually have instances on individual wells where you had a successful geological scenario. Um, you've drilled an additional well, you've actually spent more money than you would if you had a dry well, but it turns out it's not commercial, so you abandon it. Um, so that's, that's built in as well. 
Yeah. What's your favorite company? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, well, we, we cover two spaces, South America and Africa. Favorite in South America is Grand Tierra Energy. And the basic thesis there is, you know, very low risk reserves, very stable production on the downside, um, but a whole very exciting kind of exploration portfolio on the upside. Um, so good exposure there to upside potential. And then on Africa side, we like a company called, kind of an unusual company uh, called Orca Exploration Group, which is uh, offshore Tanzania. They have this Songa Songa gas field, and we think that it's really, actually in the case of valuing Orca, it's not really about Monte Carlo, it's about political risk and assessing whether or not you think the government's going to materially change the contract. Our view is, you know, given the other offshore discoveries that they've made um, in the region, there's about 30 TCF in Tanzania, that it's very unlikely that the government will be so stupid as to go after and relinquish this this material contract or this contract, um, and then sacrifice all the investment dollars that they would uh, desperately need. So we think that at the end of the day, they're going to they're going to honor the agreement, and you're going to see you know uh, uh, the stock price perform well. And I think that's my cue. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Justin. I'm glad we had you uh, back again. Because based on the number of questions, obviously, it was very worthwhile. Um, so, thanking Justin for his talk, and in recognition of his uh, talk, in lieu of a speaker gift, we will be giving a donation to a charity of his choice. Um, so that's the end of our technical presentation. I want to thank everybody for coming. If you have any ideas on topics that you'd like to see in the future, come give me uh, give me a shout. Also, Justin will be hanging around for a few minutes if you want to ask more questions. Uh, and copies of the presentation, hard copy, will be on the SP Canada website. And uh, we're hoping, if you're okay, that the video that you've taken at some point will put on our website sure. as well for future reference. So enjoy your afternoon.